Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today for our advisor best practices in supporting study of critical need languages. My name is Courtney Castillo and I am the campus liaison and selection manager for the Gilman Scholarship Program and today I'll share briefly about the Gilman Scholarship Program and then we'll have Dr. Amy Dooling, Dean of Strategic and Global Initiatives and Gilman Advisor Ambassador, Dr. Laura Little, the Director of the Global Learning Lab, and Melissa Ryan, Director of Walter Commons for Global Study and Engagement at Connecticut College, share about supporting students to study critical need languages. And at the end of our presentation, we'll have time for questions and answer, though feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. We're really glad that you're here and that you're joining us today, so let's get started. I want to share about the Gilman Scholarship Program. It's sponsored by the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, or ECA, in the U.S. Department of State. ECA leads a wide range of academic, professional, and cultural exchanges with the goal of increasing mutual understanding and respect between the people of the United States and the people of other countries. And the Gilman Scholarship is just one of the many programs that is sponsored by ECA, and Gilman Scholars become a part of a network of approximately 40,000 people who participate in ECA programs every year. The Gilman Scholarship Program is within the Office of USA Study Abroad, which is committed to shaping and sustaining a more peaceful, prosperous, and just world by increasing and diversifying participation in study abroad. So please visit their websites for more information about the great programs that ECA runs um, and to learn more about the Gilman Program as well. I want to share with you that despite obstacles to global mobility at this time, the Gilman program continues to award scholarships to students historically underrepresented in study abroad. In the two-year period of 2019-2020 and 2020-2021, 50% of Gilman scholars were from were first-generation college students, 60% were from areas outside of major cities or capitals, and 21% specifically were coming from rural communities within the United States. 70% of Gilman scholars represent racial or ethnic minority groups compared to a 31% national average for study abroad. And here you can see since the Gilman program's inception in 2001, we've supported over 34,000 US undergraduates of high financial need to study and intern abroad in over 150 countries representing over 1300 US institutions in the United States and US territories. So pretty cool. And the Gilman scholarship, um, offers scholarships of up to $5,000 for students to study and intern abroad. For the entire academic year, we will award over 3,000 scholarships, including awards for Gilman McCain and awards with our partners, oh, excuse me, um, in locations such as Portugal, Wales, New Zealand, Israel, France, and now in Germany as well. So recipients can receive up to $5,000 to use toward program costs and related expenses for their programs. Um, and award amounts do vary depending on the need of the student financially, the strength of their application, and the cost of their program. But these programs can take place during the fall, spring, summer, winter, academic year, even um, January term, uh, spring break programs as well. Uh, very flexible in terms of when the students can participate in their programs. And the Gilman program is often asked by students, you know, what are my chances in actually receiving a scholarship? And we're happy to say that generally one in every four students are awarded a Gilman scholarship. Now, briefly to talk about eligibility for the program, students need to be U.S. citizens by the time they participate in their program. They need to be undergraduate students at your institution in good standing. And they need to receive the federal Pell Grant, either when they're applying for the Gilman Scholarship or when their program is taking place. Uh, they need to be applying for a program that is credit bearing, which means that if they would like to receive credit at their home institution for the degree, they need to be eligible to receive it. Those students are not required to transfer credit back for what they're doing abroad. Um, there's not a minimum number of credits, too, that programs need to have, but the program needs to be eligible for academic credit. Also, the location in which students are going to needs to be level one or two or a select level three approved location. We also have a list of additional approved locations that are eligible for Gilman funding. Um, with designations as Gilman recipients. So those students, um, they'd be eligible to receive funding for their programs abroad, but they would be abroad as private citizens and um, 
not receive emergency support from the Gilman program all abroad or alumni benefits. But if you have questions about the update to the funding disbursement policy, we'll have recordings available of our Q&A sessions that we just had uh, this past week and the week before. So also to note that there is no longer a minimum program length for the Gilman Scholarship. So students, regardless if they're at a two-year institution, a four-year institution, can be abroad for any number of days up to one academic year for support um, from the Gilman Scholarship Program. And also to note about eligibility, we are evaluating applications for programs that are in locations that are in level three and four travel warning levels only if those warnings are because of COVID-19. And so in the event that an applicant is selected for the Gilman Scholarship and their program location is not level one or two or select level three, though it is on that list of additional approved locations for Gilman funding, they can still receive their funding um, as a Gilman recipient. But if they are interested in becoming a Gilman scholar studying abroad, with Gilman emergency support and alumni benefits, then they would need to change their program to a location that's level one or two or exceptionally approved. Though one other thing to note is that we are still supporting virtual programs, virtual exchanges. And so these virtual programs are online courses that are based outside of the US. So they can be uh, programs that are offered via direct enrollment at another institution abroad, that's online um, exchange program or program providers may run virtual programs. They could be faculty led programs that are virtual, even international internships, intensive language programs at institutions based outside of the US. Really, we're open to proposals for, from students or even you advisors if you have questions about what could potentially be a virtual program. And we are still supporting students to participate in virtual programs through start dates of April 30th, 2023. So the current application cycle that's open is um, open to virtual programs as well. And also I wanna highlight the Gilman McCain Scholarship. And this scholarship is named after the late Senator John McCain, and it is for children of military families. So it's open to eligible students enrolled at accredited US colleges and universities who receive any type of federal for financial aid. And so to apply, we do confirm that students are child dependents of active military through dependent IDs um, that they will have. And so you can see here that the eligibility requirements are very similar to the Gilman Scholarship, except for the requirement of federal for financial aid and being a child dependent of an active duty military member. So that includes the Air Force, the Army, Marine Corps, the Navy, the Coast Guard, and activated reserves. And so the Gilman McCain Awards are actually a flat $5,000 scholarship to child dependents of active duty service members. So if you have folks that um, do meet this uh, eligibility criteria, encourage them to apply for the Gilman McCain Scholarship. You can read more about that on the Gilman website. And last thing to, for me to, to highlight for you all is the Critical Need Language Award. Applicants who are studying a critical need language while abroad in a country in which it's predominantly spoken can apply for a supplemental award of up to $3,000 for a combined total of up to $8,000. And so you can see here is just a few, just a few of the languages that are uh, critical need languages and potential locations where they can be studied. The full list is on our website here on the URL that you see. And note that the Critical Need Language Award is competitive and they're offered to a limited number of students each year. So not everybody who's studying critical need languages will receive the full 8,000. Um, it, it really is competitive for the students. They have an additional essay that they're required to submit that speaks more about their study of the critical need language and how that relates to their professional, academic, even personal goals. Um, let's see. So students who are awarded the Critical Need Language Award and complete their Gilman Scholarship requirements will be offered the, the opportunity to take the ACTFL oral proficiency interview. And this test and results would serve as both an evaluation measure of the award and as a credential for the award recipient. And so like I mentioned, if folks are interested in studying critical need languages and they're interested in the additional supplemental award, they will need to submit another essay with their Gilman application. 
And so that's actually it for me talking about the Gilman Scholarship and our funding opportunities. I want to go ahead and welcome um, Amy to share and I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Courtney. Um, and thank you to all the Gilman advisors who are tuning in today to, to listen to us. Um, we are just really delighted to be presenting um, as um, uh, part of this advisor best practices series um, and to share some of the work that we've been doing um, on our campus uh, to promote the study of critical languages um, and to encourage students uh, to apply for the, the wonderful opportunity that the, the, the Gilman Critical Need Language Award um, offers. Um, so we're gonna be talking about that with you all today. Um, my name's Amy Dooling. I've been a member of the faculty at Connecticut College since uh, 1998, um, member of the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department. Um, I currently serve as the Dean of uh, uh, Global and Strategic Initiatives, Strategic and Global Initiatives. I can never remember which one comes first. Um, but in that capacity, I have the great pleasure of working with colleagues like Melissa and Lauren uh, and, and, and Laura um, to work on initiatives to integrate language learning and international experiences into uh, our academic program. Um, and also to ensure that we are um, providing access to all of our students um, to the, the kinds of opportunities that Connecticut College makes available. Um, I'll just say finally that I'm a huge fan of the Gilman program. I have been uh, advising students uh, for this program uh, for more than a decade. And so I am <clears throat> really thrilled this year to be part of the uh, new Advisor Ambassadors program. Um, so I would like Laura to just briefly introduce herself too. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks, Amy. Yes, Laura Little. I have a joint position at Connecticut College uh, as a lecturer of Slavic studies, which <clears throat> means I teach courses in mostly uh, Russian language and also in English on Eastern European cultures. And the second half of my job is directing our language resource center, which is um, called the Global Learning Lab. And I'll talk more about what that means in a minute. And I'll say hi everyone. I'm Melissa Ryan. I'm the director in the Walter Commons for Global Study and Engagement. And I also advise on postgraduate fellowships and other opportunities uh, during students' four years. So uh, very excited about the Gilman and uh, not only as, on its own, but also as a way to build a portfolio for later on and further applications. So happy to be here. Great. So if you could just advance to the next slide, um, I want to so just give you a little outline of what we're gonna be talking about. Um, our presentation is divided into roughly four parts. Um, I'm gonna just say a few words about Connecticut College um, to give uh, the advisors out there who we can't see <laughs> um, some sense of um, our particular institutional context. Um, then we're going to turn um, to the work that we have been doing for a while now um, to build a buzz around uh, language study in general uh, and to get our students thinking really early on about the connections that they can make uh, between language learning, their academic interests, their personal interests, uh, and their long-term professional goals. Um, after that, we're going to share some of the very specific ways in which we attempt to encourage students to apply for competitive awards like Gilman um, and to really understand the unique opportunity that it represents. And we will wrap up by talking very briefly about uh, what we do to set our Gilman applicants up for success uh, and what it takes to build uh, a competitive application. All right, so I'm just gonna say a few brief uh, words about Connecticut College. Um, Con is a residential liberal arts college um, in Southeastern Connecticut. You know, we're about halfway between New York and Boston. Uh, we serve about 1800 undergraduate students. You know, 99% of them live uh, on campus. Uh, they come from about 40 different states in the country and an equal number of countries around the world. Um, so you can see here some demographic data um, you know, and, and see the kind of diversity that is represented by our student body. 
Um, I want to just point out briefly because it's relevant to the kinds of students that we work with and, and how we advise them. Uh, Khan has engaged in sustained internationalization efforts um, for many decades. Um, you know, for uh, a long stretch of time, this meant um, actively recruiting international faculty uh, to the college um, and also um, being very thoughtful about recruiting international students. And this has a lot of implications for what we can do in the languages, actually. Um, but internationalization has also meant uh, expanding our curriculum and developing a whole suite of um, off-campus global experiential programs for students. Um, languages, world language study um, has always been really at the core of our approach to international education. Um, um, and so we have over the years invested in building up uh, quite a robust language curriculum. Um, at the moment, our students, all students, there's, you know, you, you can't really wave out of this requirement. Um, all students are required to take um, a full year of language study. Uh, and we bend over backwards to encourage students to do way more than that. <laughs> Um, and then finally, study abroad has also been um, a signature program at our college for, for a long time. About 50% of the junior class studies abroad for at least a semester. Um, and we are now seeing a kind of new trend um, of students uh, wanting to pursue internships abroad. Um, so they do that either in lieu of study abroad or in addition to study abroad. So those are just a few kind of highlights of, you know, some of what Khan is about. Uh, I could say a lot more. Uh, you know, if you're interested, please look at our website. Uh, it's a, an, an awesome, a small but mighty uh, liberal arts college. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to start our presentation um, really by emphasizing the importance of generating and sustaining uh, new attitudes about the purpose and value of language learning. So we are very lucky um, at, at our institution to have robust curricular and personnel resources in this area. However, you know, like many of you um, who are listening to this webinar, we are still faced uh, with the challenge that most undergraduate um, uh, American undergraduates of this generation do not naturally gravitate uh, to new languages and especially not to less commonly taught languages. In other words, the critical need languages. Um, and so for us, it has taken um, really intentional uh, and ongoing efforts um, to reframe for our students and for you know, our wider campus community, uh, reframe what language learning is all about. Um, and to help our students start making meaningful uh, linkages and, and, and feel inspired by those linkages um, between opportunities to study another language, um, their academic interests, their personal passions, and ultimately their future career goals. Um, so we have found that, you know, developing this message, message and getting it out really takes um, a real village. So if you could just advance to the next slide. So the language, if you have a language resource center, um, this will be really the epicenter of, of this messaging campaign. Um, however, offices of study abroad, career services, uh, your faculty, your alumni and your current students, I don't know why that's not on here, but your current students are also um, able to play a really critical role in amplifying uh, the value and the joy of learning new languages. Um, next. So I'm going to actually ask Laura at this point um, to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities, I mean, really incredible opportunities uh, that she has developed for students to put languages into action. So that's kind of one of the tags that we use to describe, you know, our, our campaign around languages. Um, so she's going to just share, you know, some of the highlights of things that we do. Thanks, Amy. <clears throat> yes, I can't take um, all the credit for it. I have a lot of help from my uh, colleagues, including Amy and, and Melissa. Uh, but um, so we are fortunate to have a, a language resource center at Connecticut College. It's called the uh, Global Learning Lab and it's a uh, current uh, manifestation. It has uh, had other names as 
uh, you you may be aware the the uh, language lab, as it was known when I was in college, has evolved significantly, and so we still have the traditional resources that <clears throat> come with those uh, spaces and institutions in the form of textbooks um, and films in other languages, games um, from, from various cultures. We support um, our library's subscription to Mango Languages, which is an online uh, learning language learning platform that you may have heard of. But really, in the last five years, I, I would say we've shifted uh, to our emphasis to programming. And one of the things we can do um, <clears throat> to support Gilman applicants is to identify and, and create uh, the opportunities for students to engage, actively engage the languages that they are studying or are interested in studying. Um, <clears throat> this means working with a variety of institutions on and, and off campus. So we uh, have a partnership with a local magnet school and that takes, uh, in conjunction with a course that's taught on second language acquisition, that takes the students to the school to get the experience of, of teaching <clears throat> a second language in an elementary school setting, which is a, a, a very uh, intimidating but also exciting um, way for them to uh, feel the, the, the power and, as Amy said, joy of sharing <clears throat> language study. We have weekly language lunch tables in a variety of languages, and there are there are student hosts for those. Those are open to absolutely anybody on campus, faculty, staff, and uh, students who uh, want to uh, just sit in and listen or or get practice in those languages. Uh, because we have a limited range of of offerings, language offerings in the formal curriculum, uh, we also offer a structured independent language study program or SILS. This is based on student interest and their, their own motivation to study languages that are not, um, not taught, as I said. And what does that look like? Uh, we have a, a sign up season and students, sometimes there's a limited range of languages that we're offering, or sometimes we open it up to whatever people might suggest. And then, so we bring those students together, connect them with a, a peer tutor, and they meet with a peer tutor on a weekly basis as a group. And in between, they are have some uh, small practice tasks that they're that they're doing. So there's it's not credit bearing, um, but it is it it makes a space. Uh, for students to get started with uh, and, and share their own um, experience because the tutors are uh, international students in many cases and we love to support. Um, they often have difficulty finding employment on campus and so that's a, uh, one of the benefits of it. So it connects learners with international students and sometimes experienced um, learners who are not international students necessarily but have I don't know, a couple of years of learning under their belt and so they are uh, uh, powerful um, models for our students who are, are just getting started. We also have a variety of of kind of seasonal or um, events that, that take place, uh, <clears throat> language challenges, uh, International Poetry Night, uh, World Languages Day, Global Cinema Series, and, and so on. And, and I realized that I um, talked about the partnership, but I didn't cue the video. And I think somebody uh, just made the same realization. So this is a cute video about, um, the partnership with the local uh, magnet school that I mentioned. I don't think you can really understand other people or other cultures unless you speak their language or know a little bit of, about their language at least because a lot of culture is coded in a language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's me, Tashrafna. The Khan students are learning about language acquisition in their class and they're learning about teaching language. Just because you speak another language doesn't mean you can teach that language. We weren't best by uh, doing things in uh, 
probably the best way ever to learn something is to teach it. So the first part of the class is just learning like how people learn languages in general. So from like a kid, like how you learn your first language. One of the main things is socializing you into the language. We try to do like small groups so that it's more like one-on-one -on -one conversations. And so that helps when they can understand something, even if the rest of the class doesn't, because they can help their peers understand. It helps the con students consolidate their language skills. It helps them work on their teaching if they're planning to become teachers. You kind of see how children are like sponges and you can just say something once and they'll pick it up and I think that's really like exciting. These are Krasny. The Krasny. Need a belly. It helps our kids because this gives our kids an entry into the fact that there are lots of other people in the world besides us and they start to perhaps develop a broader Worldview. I took Arabic because my dad's sister, she's Spanish, but she loves the language Arabic and she speaks it. So I would like to learn how to speak it, write it, so I could have like a conversation with her. Students, especially young students, are more open to learning languages, especially teaching languages that are less commonly taught, like Arabic and Russian. Those are really important languages of our world, and they're really difficult to learn. Learning Russian was really fun when they taught it to us. It wasn't like listening to teachers saying everything and wishing you wanted to be home. The immediate payoff is that they are seeing many languages that are spoken throughout the world, and they are hopefully getting inspired to become lifelong language learners. Uh, what we uh, uh, try to establish in the RMS is a community of learners. Sun, <laughs>
things like airline tickets or visa require requirements or passports even, and, and loss of work study, which for our students that are on work study and are trying to study away for a semester, that's often a concern. So we've created this Global Scholars Fund. And what we've done is required students to apply for outside funding if they are going to apply for the, to, in order to be eligible for the Global Scholars Fund. So we talk about the Gilman a lot, and that's one of the resources that they can apply for in addition to the Global Scholars Fund. So we've incentivized um, Gilman in that way. All right, I think we'll move on to the next slide and talk a bit just about career services. Um, so we have found, and I'm sure many of the advisors uh, listening today have also discovered this, right? You can find excellent partners uh, in your career centers. Um, our career advisors do a really terrific job these days um, reinforcing the value of language learning by connecting uh, second language skills to 21st century career readiness. Um, and so they talk about that. It really um, kind of uh, reinforces what they're hearing from faculty, what they're hearing from Laura Little in the, in the uh, Global Learning Lab, um, and what they're hearing in the Walter Commons in general. Um, they also, you know, are um, great at promoting the Gilman uh, Scholarship. You know, each when when you know a new round is opening up, um, the career services, you know, um, helps to get the word out. Um, one very specific thing that we've done that we wanted to share was uh, a grant that we got um, several years ago. We've recently completed it um, from the U.S. Department of Education. Um, it was specifically to fund um, an expanded number of foreign language internships for our students. Um, but it had a lot of, you know, really interesting outcomes, among them um, a kind of uh, connection between our language faculty and our career advisors that had not previously existed. Um, so together they, they did some work in this grant um, and it's established a kind of new, uh, you know, sort of a new space for cross fertilization of, of ideas. Um, and so, um, you know, it, another outcome frankly was a set of classes that the faculty designed that our career advisors are really thrilled about. Um, these are a, a set of new courses that emphasize um, kind of um, language learning in professional settings. So we have a new course on business Chinese and a German course around the culture of work. And um, I, I'm not sure I can think of any other specific exa examples, but we've got them sort of across different languages. Um, but it includes things like training students how to, um, uh, to write a resume in a second language. Um, so it's, it's just another way of sort of connecting the pieces for our students. Um, next slide. Faculty, of course. I mean, this is obvious, but uh, our, the faculty, your faculty, our faculty for sure are great champions of language learning. But one thing that we have learned is that, um, um, you know, in addition to language faculty themselves, uh, there are faculty across the disciplines who by virtue of their own background or their experience or their research um, have second language skills, um, often use them actively in their research. Um, and they can be terrific partners um, in, in the work around um, building enthusiasm for, for language study. So we actually now have um, a, quite a wide swath of faculty, you know, political scientists and historians and sociologists who teach one credit courses, uh, one, one credit sections, discussion sections that are attached you know, to, to their courses that they're teaching in English. Um, and these are discussion sections uh, in a language beyond English. Um, we have other faculty who regularly participate in events that, um, you know, where they're able to kind of model the ways in which uh, linguistic skills and intercultural competencies uh, you know, are related to the to the research that they do. Um, so, so faculty are a great uh, a great resource. But I guess the one tip that we would share is that they're faculty beyond the usual suspects uh, who might really be interested in working with you. And then finally, um, we have you know alumni and current students. Courtney, if you could, yes. So. 
we know at our institution, our students are most inspired by their own peers. And they love to hear about what, what, what Connecticut college students do after they've graduated. Um, and so we have developed a number of different um, you know, series and events and programming that bring our alumni back to campus. Uh, it's so easy these days with virtual technology. Um, and uh, uh, so that we can connect them to, to current students. Uh, a few years ago, we actually, we, we got, we really started loving videos, uh, but we reached out to a group of young alumni. We said, you know, shoot a video on your phone, send it back. Uh, and we made this terrific video of, of students from, you know, sort of recent classes, all of whom were doing, you know, fabulous things out there in the world um, and all had stories about how, um, um, the fact that they had learned a language in college had, had directly shaped their path after con, albeit in unexpected kinds of ways. So I don't think that we probably have time to watch this video, um, but we could maybe drop the uh, link into the chat if anybody wants to watch it. It's a very inspiring uh, video. We screened it at our you know, first year orientation for a number of years. And in those years, uh, we noticed a discernible uptick in enrollments in uh, Russian and Chinese in the critical languages because some of the alumni that are featured are students who study those languages. All right, I think, yes, we're, so now we're gonna move on to kind of the next section of this presentation, which is what you've all come to, 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 to really hear about, which is how do we uh, convince students to apply um, not just for the Gilman, but specifically for the Critical Need Language Award. Um, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the efforts we've made to just elevate languages in general on our campus. Um, but we are now just going to talk more specifically about motivating students to take, take that step. Um, so Melissa is going to talk about you know the recruitment efforts that she makes, which are so important, but then also um, some other some other tips. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, I think that starting early and uh, to build relationships with students and to get them thinking about these things is the, the best piece of advice I can give in regards to recruitment. I mean, we talk to our students as early as for their first year, even before they're thinking about where they're going to study away, um, about the benefits of studying away and about different ways that they can engage um, with languages and cultures early on in their in their college career. So I think um, we, we work with the Division of Institutional Equity and Inclusion and with our other partners around campus. I, I go to classes, we have info sessions in the Walter Commons. We um, invite uh, students to things like International News Hour so that we can try and come, you know, get our domestic students together with international students to develop uh, some community there and get them interested in uh, exploring the world in different ways than maybe they thought about. Um, when it comes time to talking about the Gilman, I mean, money matters. And so we certainly the funding piece is important to our students. Um, outreach, re, you know, re, getting into the newsletters for the deans of the college and getting the word out about Gilman is really important, especially because we, we, we are unable to get a targeted list of Gilman applicants, of Pell applicants or Pell recipients from our financial aid office. So we just really try to push the information out as far and wide as possible. And then when we're talking to students in these info sessions and talking with other uh, counterparts around campus about why they should be talking about Gilman to their students, um, extra funding is a big piece of it. The, the fact that um, applying for the critical language uh, extra award is not really much work. It's you know it's one more um, one more short essay question that they will have to answer. Um, that obviously through studying abroad and language immersion, they're going to get more from their time abroad, and and they're going to get to go to places that are off the beaten track, which is um, more interesting for them, and oftentimes more interesting in the future. 
when they are applying for uh, jobs or graduate school or other postgraduate fellowships. Um, the fact that they have stretched themselves in those ways is often uh, a highlight and will make them stand out. So in addition to the competitive professional edge, it opens up their world to the possibilities of studying or, or applying for opportunities later on that will take them even further afield. Um, and also we, we talk about how critical languages are the world's most widely spoken languages. And so I think the importance of, of explaining where these languages are spoken and where, where in the world they may end up going if they apply for a critical need grant is important. Courtney, if you wanna to go to the next slide, please. Um, we've just listed out the different areas that and countries where the students might be applying to study away or for international internships and where they might use these languages. Um, we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, another infographic that we found, and these are the kinds of things we might post on social media, um, put in our newsletters and even play games um, when we have info sessions on guessing wh where in the world they might be speaking these languages. You go, yeah. Um, and then a visual is always helpful to, to show them that 2000 characters is actually not a lot and is not a daunting task. And we offer, um, always offer drop-in advising sessions around Gilman and critical language scholarship and, and other opportunities. And we offer writing workshops. So we don't just send them to the writing center. We actually sit down with them um, and work on, work on their applications with them. I think, um, uh, the next slide will show another resource for that we advise students to, to avail themselves of, and that's Diversity Abroad. Um, and the Diversity Abroad website, if, if you're not familiar with it, is something that I encourage you to explore, but also you can send your students directly to. Even if you're not a member, there are a lot of free resources that will um, uh, talk to them about identities abroad, talk to them about different regions in the world, give them resources on um, actual study abroad opportunities, and it's just a really, uh, and on funding opportunities, it's a, it's a wonderful resource that we, we use often in all of the work that we do. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's, I, I guess I want to underscore that, um, you know, on our campus, even with all the steps we've taken to kind of celebrate language learning and, and the learning of critical languages and the resources that we have, the fact is, you know, our students and, and students, I think, across the United States are still really overwhelmingly drawn to the romance languages, so not the critical need languages, um, and, and most often seek out um, European destinations for study abroad. So you really do need to have, you know, a kind of small arsenal of, of reasons and arguments that you can pull out to make the case for why this is, um, you know, such an investment in uh, in a student's future uh, and the kind of opportunities that they might not really imagine would come attached to, you know, taking a risk in, in studying a new language, going off the beaten track. Um, so that's just something that we have learned on our campus. Um, all right, so this is kind of, we're in the home stretch here and we're, we're not too far behind time. We just wanna offer some, you know, a few general and specific tips for helping students produce competitive uh, uh, Gilman applications. So um, I think Melissa was gonna say uh, our number <laughs> one general tip and it was so important to us that we forgot to list it. <laughs> but it is the best tip and that is to volunteer to sit on panels. So whether it's as a Gilman reader or as a critical language um, scholarship reader, or if you're able to in the Fulbright process, but sitting through and reading through many applications and deliberating over those applications is really the, the best way, I think, to learn about these opportunities and to really understand how to guide your students in putting together strong applications. I think both Laura and I would echo that, you know, having served as 
uh, readers for you know CLS and Gilman, you know, it really there just there is nothing that compares. You will become a much better advisor uh, once you have served as a panelist. Um, when you really understand, you know, what it takes to uh, stand out as an application, um, what your students are competing against. So um, yes, we 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 do encourage that. Um, we have a few other general tips, um, want, which I think Laura was going to just quickly take us through. Sure. I mean, uh, one of the reasons that I uh, we talked about the uh, kind of opportunities that we have identified and created is so that students can name those. And we have a little uh, gift for everybody in the webinar today. In, in, you know, depending on what is available on your campus, um, <clears throat> students may not uh, be able to find opportunities. We don't offer any uh, support for now, for example, of Azerbaijani, um, <clears throat> just to take one example of a critical need language. But we can, um, I'm going to try to uh, send a, a document to you, a PDF, uh, which has, it's not working, however, um, which has a list of, of, of digital resources that you can uh, share with students. So it goes language by language and, um, and there are various free and, and minimal cost um, <clears throat> uh, tools that they can use to kind of get started and advance their language study. Uh, it, talking about application through talking through applications with students, we encourage them to leverage all of their second language or second cultural experience, even if that is not the language that they are interested in uh, studying uh, <clears throat> and their study away, because it is all relevant and, and in terms of being able to demonstrate that they have experience, they know what, um, what the challenges are, that they uh, can overcome them and um, show that uh, flexibility. And uh, talking about the application as not a, a, a you know, a, a single event that they're going to invest all of this time and, and effort into, but as a, an opportunity to craft a profile and to, to generate some language that will come in handy later when they are applying for other um, uh, fellowships, scholarships, or even, you know, uh, writing a narrative uh, about themselves in, in a job, letter of job uh, application. Anything to add there, Amy? No, I think that, that, was, that was great. Um, so for for the application, we're, we're almost done here. So the application itself, right? There's the students who apply for the critical uh, uh, need language um, supplemental award, you know, have to do the regular Gilman application. We've already referenced the fact that, you know, to get this extra funding, there is a, 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 an additional essay. And, you know, the essay is extremely short. We, we showed you the visual, it's, you know, it's a paragraph. Um, and, but here are the tips that we have, right? You know, students, there, there are three prompts, three things that, that that very short paragraph must address. And students often don't read the directions well and actually don't answer the, the very specific questions. So make sure that students are actually, you know, addressing those prompts. At, at Con, we often match students up with other students to read each other's applications and just to do like a checklist. Did you answer the prompts, right? Did you cover those points? So that's a good kind of practice. Um, what I want to say, though, um, is that you, as an advisor, you you need to um, ensure that students understand that as even though it's very short, that supplemental essay, uh, and and the supplemental essay is actually evaluated on its own merits. However, it is an extension of the application, and so one needs to, you know, the student needs to have some kind of consistency in what they presented in the main application uh, that is carried through into that supplemental essay. Um, so, so that's an important, it's not an afterthought. It's not just an add-on, right? It really should be integrated with what has already been discussed in the rest of the application. Um, the second tip is, is really about demonstrating commitment to achieving proficiency. So that's you know language that the Gilman puts out there and they're looking for that in applications. But the operative term, and we, we underscore this for our students, to demonstrate commitment is different from talking about 
commitment and just simply saying that one is committed. And it's really about showing commitment. So um, make, making students understand the difference between saying and showing in an application is very effective. Um, and having them think about things that they've actually done. So whether it's participating in some activity that you, you offer on your campus or something they've done in their own community or elsewhere that, that demonstrates how they are um, you know, really committed to achieving mastery in a language is way more effective than just simply talking about it. Um, and then the connection, right, between language learning, academic studies, and future career plans. It is this, you know, it's those connections that are, that are so powerful in the actual application. Um, and so helping students think through what that means, right, um, is, is going to be an effective thing you can do as an advisor. Um, and so having that conversation, frankly, about future um, fellowships and scholarships, you know, like the Boren or the CLS or, or Fulbright is a great way of having students get concrete about what it is uh, that they want to do and how they see their immediate future and long term future. Um, and then finally, we've got just a few, you know, we, you know, it's great that Gilman is now supporting virtual programs uh, for the time being. Um, we just want to note that there, there are two program providers that we have worked with at COM. We're not, we're not endorsing them, but we just happen to know that they have, um, they are, are currently offering virtual programs for several of the critical need languages. Um, and as Melissa already said, diversity abroad is another wonderful place to, to look for um, uh, you know, opportunities for virtual pro, uh, programs around language learning. All right, we're gonna, you know, we one more minute, um, just to, we wanted to showcase one of our success stories. Um, Hillary is a recent grad of Khan. Um, she came um, to the college as a Posse scholar from Chicago. Um, and she took up the study of Chinese in her first year. And she just really wanted to go to China. Um, so she applied for a Gilman and the critical uh, need language award um, and and received it um, and was able to spend a whole semester in a very off the beaten track kind of location in, in northeastern China. Um, so when she got back, she actually scored um, an advanced low, which is very, very good for Chinese on the actual oral proficiency exam, uh, exam that um, Courtney talked about. This is a great credential that you can put right into your resume. Um, and Hillary is now, you know, happily back in Chicago, has a job, she's using her Chinese, uh, working in, in a wonderful community-based social services agency uh, that supports uh, low-income Im immigrant and refugee uh, communities. So we're very proud of Hillary and, you know, what the study of language has enabled her to do. And, you know, and we're very grateful that Gilman um, helped make that possible. So we have five minutes left, I think, for, for questions. I don't know if anything has come into the chat, but that really concludes uh, our presentation. Uh, we are happy if, if folks you know, have follow-up questions or wanna learn a little bit more about what we briefly skimmed over, just you know, feel free to reach out to us directly. Yeah, thank you, Amy, Laura, Melissa. We really appreciate you sharing about critical need language study at Con and your tips and tricks for our other advisors on the call. I know that I learned a lot from what you had to share. Um, we have another slide for any final thoughts before we go back to your contact information for questions, but did you want to have any closing items for the group? Nope. Okay, cool. We'll put the contact info back up. <laughs> So if you all have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A box or in the chat. I think folks have just been absorbing all of the great information that you all have shared. I know I definitely have. Um, but to highlight, uh, Melissa shared the second video of what they put together to highlight language study from their alumni at, at Con, And then also Laura provided the document about critical language learning resources for all of you in the chat too. So thank you for those. But yeah, um, looks like nothing's coming through at this time.
So if y'all don't have any other questions, can definitely hop off. I just want to say a huge thank you again to Amy, Laura, Melissa for your time and for sharing about critical language study. Um, and thank you all for joining us on your afternoon or morning, depending on where you're coming from. Yes. Thank, thank you, you, Courtney. Thanks thank so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, y'all. We'll be on for a couple more minutes, but um, feel free if y'all need to leave. Um, we're thankful that you were here. We actually, we're hosting a drop-in Gilman uh, writing session now, right at, immediately following this. So oh, perfect. Can, yeah. That is so perfect.